This is a video that you have asked for. There has been a lot of interest in our plywood cutting jig, and I spent all of that video showing how to use it. So naturally, some of you wrote and asked if I wouldn't show how to make it. Well, I can do that. And I'll do you one better. Since some of you don't have access to a shop full of woodworking tools, I'm going to make this thing with nothing more than a circular saw, a hand drill, and a few hand tools. That includes cutting curved surfaces like this, with this. You know, some of you who do have a shop full of woodworking tools may want to ride along, just in case someday you're broken down by the side of the road without a bandsaw in sight. Ow. The heart of the cutting grid is this knockdown sawhorse. It comes apart into four pieces, two legs, a rail, and a loading arm. These pieces are assembled from just eight wooden parts, and you will need to make multiple copies of most of the parts. Each leg assembly is made from three parts, two legs, right and left, a horizontal spacer, and two gussets, front and back. The rail is a long piece of lumber to which eight cleats are attached, four near the front and four more at the back. The loading arm is another piece of lumber, rounded at the top end. A small spacer and a lip are glued and screwed to the bottom end. Most of the wood in this sawhorse is made from one and a half inch or 38 millimeter thick construction lumber. It's called two by lumber here in the States, although there's nothing two about it. The gussets on the sides of the legs is made from one quarter inch or six millimeter thick plywood. Now, I've designed this sawhorse so that you can set it up and knock it down without fooling with hardware. You simply slide the legs in and out of the cleats and you're done. For this to work, the legs are set at 15 degree angles front to back. Gravity holds the sawhorse together. In fact, the heavier the load on the horse, the sturdier it becomes, within reason of course. The legs play out from the sides at 25 degree angles and the tops and the bottom of the legs are beveled at 15 degree angles so that they will rest flat on the ground and the plywood will rest flat on the grid. In fact, they're double beveled, so you don't have to worry about which leg goes where and which direction it should face. This also simplifies the setup. This sounds like a lot of angles to cut, but the fact is it's no more work than cutting things square. If you know how to make compound angles, you can do this with a single setup. And the fact is, you know how to make compound angles. You do it every time you pick up a circular saw, you cut across the board at 90 degrees with the saw blade set at 90 degrees to the sole. That's a 90-90 compound angle. We don't sweat it because that's the way our world fits together. If we lived in that part of the universe where everything leaned at 15 or 25 degrees, we'd sweat blood every time we had to make a square cut. Let's make a leg. The trouble is, making this with a circular saw obscures the work because it happens under the saw. So I'm going to make one leg on a table saw so you can see what's going on, and then we'll make the rest on the circular saw. Cut your leg stock about 32 inches or 813 millimeters long. Attach a long board to your miter gauge to extend the face. Angle the miter gauge at 65 degrees, 25 degrees off square, and tilt the saw blade 15 degrees. Mark the 25 degree miters on your leg stock. The marks should be exactly 29 and 13 16 inches or 757 millimeters apart. Cut the compound miter in one end of the board and move the miter gauge to the other slot in your saw and cut the other end. The ends now have a single bevel at 15 degrees. Mark each end dividing it in half from edge to edge. Turn the board 180 degrees end for end, keeping the top and the bottom surfaces the same. Once again, cut compound miters in the legs, splitting the marks you just made so the ends are now double beveled. In order to cut these compound angles with a circular saw, it helps to make a simple cutting jig from plywood and two by lumber. This jig turns this saw into a miter saw. Now, it's going to get pretty chewed up, so I suggest you make it out of scraps or sacrificial lumber. 
You can find that at the sacrificial bin in your lumber yard. Attach a fence to the top of the table angled 115 degrees from the back edge. That's 25 degrees off square. Angle the sole of your circular saw so the blade is 15 degrees off square. Adjust the depth of cut so the saw will cut through the table, the workpiece, and partway into the base, about two inches or 51 millimeters deep. Then cut a curve in the jig, guiding the saw along the fence. Don't cut all the way through the backstop. Put a block of two by wood under the kerf you just cut and drill a one inch or 25 millimeter hole that straddles the kerf. This will let you see the cut marks. Mark the miters on the stock, both ends. Then slide the stock into the jig and line up the marks with a kerf that you just cut and clamp it down. Cut one end of the leg, guiding the circular saw along the fence. Release the clamp, reposition the leg, and cut the other end. Note that I'm using a sacrificial 2 by spacer to help keep the table from sagging on some of the cuts. Mark the ends, dividing them in half. Turn the board 180 degrees end for end, and align the mark on the end with the kerf in the 2 by 4 spacer that holds the table above the base. This is a little difficult to see because you have to look under the table. A flashlight may help. Cut the miters again, splitting the marks to make the double bevels. While you're set up to make 25 degree miters, make the spacers. First, readjust the circular saw so the sole is square to the blade. Make another pass over the jig to trim the table with the blade square. Cut the first miter, then turn the stock top for bottom. Mark the length of the spacer on the stock and cut the second miter. Let's set the legs and the spacers aside for the moment and we'll get ready to make the cleats. Now we're going to make these pretty much the same way we made the spacers but we cut these parts at 15 degrees. Move the fence a few inches to the right or left on the jig and reattach it to the table 105 degrees from the back edge or 15 degrees off square. Cut a curve and drill another peephole a short distance out from the fence. Then cut the cleats, mitering the ends at 15 degrees. Do not turn the stock over as you did when making the spacers. Instead, Measure seven and a half inches or 191 millimeters between each cut. That is presuming that your rail is seven and a quarter inches or 184 millimeters wide. If it isn't, you may have to adjust the length of the cleats. You also need to taper the tops of the legs at 25 degrees and the outboard cleats at 15 degrees. Move the fence again, this time attaching it square to the back edge and the same distance from the right end of the table as it is from the edge of the sole to the blade. Make a pass with the saw to make sure that the blade just kisses the square end of the table. Mark the tapers on the workpiece, then place them under the table, lining up the marks with the table's end. Hold them in place by driving wire nails through the table and into the leg or cleat. Cut the taper, guiding the saw along the fence. Then pry up the nails and remove the workpiece. A quick tip when you're using wire brads and nails. Don't hammer them. Just tap them in with a light hammer. That will make them less likely to bend. And now for the magic trick that I promised to show you. We're going to round over the top corners of the rails and the top ends of the lifting arms using a circular saw. But first, we have to drill 3 8 inch or 10 millimeter holes in the rails and the arms. Now, if you don't have a drill press, drilling holes square to a surface can be quite a challenge, but I have two suggestions. 
The first is to use a portable drill guide when making these holes. This keeps the drill properly aligned to the work. The second is to make a portable drill guide. This is just a vertical V jig. Keep the bit cradled in the V as you work and the resulting hole will be reasonably square to the surface. Also, drill a hole in the sawing jig through the table and partway into the base. To locate that hole, first measure the width of the stock that you're using for the loading arm and divide by two. Position the hole that same distance away from the right end and the front edge of the table. Make sure that the fence that you use to cut the tapers is still attached to the sawing jig. Then slide the rail stock under the table and align the hole in the rail with the hole that you just drilled in the table. Insert a dowel in the holes in the table and the rail to serve as a pivot. Rotate the rail stock out about 10 degrees from the backstop and make a pass with the saw, removing a little stock from the corner. Rotate it another 10 degrees and repeat. Keep on until you've rotated the rail 90 degrees. Okay, let's remove the dowel and see what we've got. <laughs> see that? Pretty nicely rounded over. And you can round over the top of the loading arm exactly the same way. It's a little rough, but you can always smooth it out with a rasp. To cut the gussets, it helps to make another sawing jig. Or you can just take the one you have, turn it over, and use the base. Attach a one quarter inch or six millimeter thick strip to the edge to serve as a fence. And then attach a sawing guide angled at 115 degrees or 25 degrees off square to the fence. Adjust the depth of cut of your circular saw so that it cuts through the plywood gusset and about an eighth of an inch or three millimeters into the base. Cut a strip of one quarter inch or six millimeter plywood as wide as you need for the gussets. Slide it under the guide with one end showing and cut a 25 degree miter. Turn the strip top for bottom and slide it sideways in the jig to line it up for the second cut. You might want to mark the position of the mitered end of the plywood on the jig. This will make it easier to set up for each successive cut. Make another cut, creating a piece of plywood that looks like a truncated pyramid. That's your gusset. Repeat until you have made all of the eight gussets that you need. To cut the slots in the gussets, Reposition the fence for a square cut. Then make a square cut in a scrap of plywood so as to create a kerf in the fence. We're going to use this kerf to position these gussets for each of the coming cuts. Mark the slot on the gusset blank and set up to cut the first side. Remember, the kerf must go on the inside of the slot. Use some scraps to keep the gussets from moving when cutting the slots. Make the first cut, stopping when it's just seven and a half inches or 151 millimeters long. Reposition the gusset and make the second cut, once again stopping at the bottom of the slot. Cut the bottom of the slot with a sharp chisel, driving the chisel through the plywood with a mallet. Don't worry if the bottom of the slot is a little ragged. If you want, you can clean it up with a rasp. There's just one more thing to do before we can assemble this sucker. We need to cut the slots in the rails that will hold the stretchers. Now experience tells me that these slots should be about one eighth of an inch wider, that's three millimeters wider than the stretchers they will hold. Using a handsaw, cut the sides of the slots, stopping when each cut is three and a half inches or 89 millimeters long. That's as long as the stretchers are wide. Use a sharp chisel to knock out most of the waste from each slot and then flatten the bottom of the slot with a rasp. Test fit the stretcher or a piece of wood that is as thick and as wide as the stretcher in each slot. The slot must hold its stretcher flush to the top of the rail. And while you're set up for hand sawing, find some scraps of plywood and two by material that you need for the spacer and the lips of the loading arm and then cut them.
Let's put all these pieces together. I'm going to start with the legs since those are the most difficult. Each leg is made up of several mitered pieces that must be held at the proper angle and distance from one another. Furthermore, all the leg assemblies have to be precisely the same. To do this, I've made an assembly jig. Now I know that I'm overstressing your supply of sacrificial plywood, but this is the last time, I promise. Attach some wood blocks to a sheet of plywood to hold the legs and spacer in position. Then place two legs and one spacer between those blocks. Attach a gusset to the legs and spacer with glue and nails. Then lift the legs and spacer out of the jig, turn the assembly over, and attach the second gusset. When you assemble the cleats and rails, make sure to put the tapered cleats outboard, that is, closest to the ends, with the tapered surfaces square to the edges of the rails. These tapered surfaces should be exactly three and a half inches or 89 millimeters back from the ends of the rails. This is important. The outboard cleats serve as a stop for the loading arms so that you can't push them backwards too far. Without these stops, it would be much harder to load and unload plywood from the arms. And finally, when you glue up the loading arm spacers and lips, drive a screw through all three parts. This will help the spacers support the weight of sheet material. And here, folks, is the completed cutting grid. Now, one of the sawhorses I made with no other power tools other than the circular saw and handheld drill. The other one, I used my complete shop full of exotic woodworking tools. And as you can see, there isn't a lick of difference between the two. They're both good enough for government work, which just goes to show that sometimes when you think what you need is another expensive tool, what you really need is a little ingenuity and a persistent shop dog. Oh, and some sacrificial plywood and a hammer. You can always use a good hammer.